once more, good evening everybody. I'm Nima Bakshi. I am the co-president of the Silicon Valley of ASAP. My partner in crime and fast becoming close friend, John Soper, is the other co-president. And we are absolutely thrilled with the three people sitting in between us in terms of what we're going to talk about with their help and with you this evening. So if, you, if you'll give me a couple minutes to go through a little bit of setup, it'll give you some context for what it is we're doing up here, what our topic is, how we're going to flow this evening, and where you get involved. Um, as I do that, I want to start with a thanks. Um, as you can tell, if uh, in, in today's digital world, you can have people crowd and see nobody, there's another way to get energy into a room, and that's when a lot of very seasoned, talented people come together um, and are ready to engage on a game-changing topic. And so thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, John is going to elaborate on just how diverse a group you really are. We couldn't have put this kind of event together. We could not have put this kind of series. And today is, this evening is the first of three series that we call Game Changer. We'll go into more about what that means in a second. Without the help of Cisco Systems. Cisco Systems, I call it a lifelong companion to ASAP in terms of um, providing insights, uh, visions, best practices, and even methods of driving alliances and business partnering in the world today. And in this context, they were extremely, extremely supportive of the venue we wanted to create, the panelists we wanted to bring together. Um, and with that, they, I, we have deemed them the executive sponsors of the Game Changing Series, this being the first. A huge thank you to Raja, Raja Sundaram, and Raja's team, Shelly Hill, Sarah Brown. I've done a ton, as you can tell, in making this a great start. Thank you, Raja. Thank you, Shelly. OK, so um, this is one of those topics where every day you think, I'm going to stop here. And I'm, I've got plenty of examples about how fast, how much, and how deep the world is changing from a business sphere, financially, sovereign uh, issues galore. Um, and yet, every day you pick up the paper or you look at what you, if you have a Twitter account, and it just won't stop. So what we, let, let me introduce then what we wanted to talk about in the, in the frame of Game Changer. And then I'm going to turn it over to John to, in, to talk about the people we have, the audience that we have to participate in the discussion. Game Changer put in one sentence is about strategic shifts, paradigm-based strategic shifts. And simply said, if you look at the business world the way you might have looked at it three years ago, you're dead wrong. And we'll get into some examples about um, how we're seeing that play out. So when we talk about Game Changer and the age of the platform and the 24-hour customer tonight, we're going to take a little bit of time up front to introduce some frameworks, some terminology, and some mapping of some of the, the titans of today into ways we think you should think about for your own businesses. Um, and with that, John, maybe you can talk about who we have in the room and the number of companies that we have represented here. Okay, and thank you, Nima. And it's been a pleasure working with you uh, also, especially on this uh, inaugural event for our new program series. So we're very excited about it. And uh, as Nima said, we have just a, a great uh, uh, diversity of people and talent that have come here. And uh, we're delighted with the number of people that have decided to uh, show uh, grace us with their presence. And so we've also, though, looked at the number of companies that they're representing. And is there a, we have a slide showing that. It's, is that the clicker? Okay. I think you want that one. <laughs> And what is interesting is, I, th I think we've added some more since this slide was built, but there are 35 companies 
that are represented here. And what's interesting in going through the list is that they represent a whole range of companies, mostly from the Valley, mostly technology, but um, they are product, service, consulting. They are small, medium, large. We have a startup in the group, uh, and they are at all levels of the learning curve on the topic for tonight, which is the digital platform. So we think that's great. And one of the things we're excited about, about the range of people and companies, is we're trying to develop a diverse mix of people that I think will energize the community and the network that we're really trying to develop here. It's more than us just talking to you. It's all of us engaging in the subject. Um, so I will just add my one uh, editorial comment that I, I love working in technology because every 10 years or more, especially here, there's a, there's a revolution. And you know, so it just doesn't get dull. And so we're at that inflection point, and that's what Nima is referring to, and uh, I'll turn it back over to you to get us started. Thank you, John. So with respect to the game changer in people, what, what we thought would be helpful to, to us as, as a group and to you as, a, as an audience would be to have, a, to have people who have written, and therefore you see some books in the, in the room, written about the topic, and therefore given us a kind of analytical view, um, a, some tools, and some ways to think about how the age of the platform is manifesting, both in terms of market competition, in terms of ways that you can design your own businesses and platforms as you uh, convert your, uh, your business models to the digital enterprise era. We also thought what was important to mirror reflect the author's view is the market maker's view. And so when we thought about the panel as a, not just panels as in a silo-based view, but in a fabric, we thought, A, Phil Simon is writing about this from a business provider's viewpoint. And the book he's, he's just released called The Age of the Platform is something he's going to get into in just a few moments. Think of that as upstream in the value chain. On the other end of the value chain, we have Adrian Ott. The CEO of Exponential Edge, a renowned author in her own right, a recognized entrepreneur um, in many business circles today and in past times. And Adrian represents what we are as individuals, the consumer. And we're going to talk about how consumers are organizing, not just in retail-oriented ways, but some examples around what, how Occupy Wall Street is an example of how we have decided to take our leverage unify without a preordained charter and make, make a statement uh, to very powerful sec, uh, forces in our, in our world. And then lastly, again, the market maker's view. So Sherry could say, great, I'm going to sit back for a couple of years, <laughs> let this all play out, and then <laughs> cherry pick what I want to do. Just tell me what you wanted me to do. <laughs> Where are we going? And we'll follow. <laughs> but instead, it, what, and we're going to get into this in the visuals, Salesforce is, is emerging as a market maker in its own right, not just in the platforms that we hear about in the, the, the CRM context or the force.com context or the chatter context, but really thinking about this in a pipeline mode, about what, what forms of collaboration, what forms of alliances, what is going to not only energize an ecosystem of developers so that they can move into new business areas outside of CRM, for example, but really, what are going to be those business motions of the future? And if anybody was at Dreamforce, you would hear how they converted the discussion, unlike most technology forums today, into cause-based communities. And most of the breakouts got into a very high form of what we are as, uh, as members of the digital community. So that is the spectrum we wanted to introduce with our panelists. And with that, I'm going to actually ask each of one of them, Phil, Adrian, then Sherrick, to introduce themselves personally. Hello, my name is Phil Simon. I'm the author of four books. My latest is called The Age of the Platform, How Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google Have Redefined Business. I'm Adrian Ott. I'm author of The 24-Hour Customer. 
It was named a Best Business Book 2010 and also won several awards. I also have been here in the Valley for quite a few years and have been a member of ASAP and thank you for having us here today. Uh, my company consults with a number of uh, clients here in the Valley and also outside the Valley and we help them with uh, go-to-market strategies and um, uh, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Sherrick Murdoff uh, with Salesforce.com. Um, uh, I run partner development and investments, which means I look at strategic recruitment of uh, partners, and then we also actually invest in partners. So um, I've not written a book, but uh, I have been in alliances for the past uh, 16 years since I actually started at PwC before the C, dating myself a little bit. So I was a consultant way back in the day with Price Waterhouse. And uh, thank you very much for having me here and for having Salesforce. We are, uh, um, Salesforce has been um, a lot more partner friendly, I would say, over the last couple of years. And so we're getting, trying to get more involved with ASAP, uh, doing a lot more with partners like Capgemini and others. And so I uh, appreciate you having us here and look forward to talking to you after too. Thank you, Sherry. So guys, let's get going. Um, Phil, so you've come out with the three books. This fourth book called The Age of the Platform, how I, I may not do it in the right order unless I look at it, but Apple, Google, Amazon, and Facebook have redefined how we do business. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> how have they redefined how we do business? And they've really put forth an entirely new model, and that's the sort of book in one sentence. Um, these companies have done absolutely amazing things in relatively short periods of time, Apple being the one exception. But before we go there, I want to have some fun first. Show of hands, who uses Amazon? OK. <laughs> Apple. Facebook. Google. OK. Does anyone not use one of those four companies' products or services? Really? <laughs> I don't use Facebook. No, but I'm saying, do you not use, does anyone not use any of them? Oh. OK. So these companies have become ubiquitous. And how have they done it? And that's what the book is about. Because you don't have to be a company with billions in revenue to build a platform. I'm a perfect example of it. I can tell a personal story for a moment, and this is actually in the book. 2008, I'm a technology consultant by way of background. I had my best year ever in a horrible economy. I was billable 51 weeks out of the year. I went from project to project. I juggled a bunch of ones concurrently. And I realized that it was very dangerous because all of my revenue came from one particular stream. So over the last three years, I diversified. I've written four books. I started a publishing company. I've done different types of consulting. I've built my own platform by adding different planks. And when I thought about that in the context of the four companies that I profiled, the Gang of Four, it was obvious to me that I was onto something big. Sorry? The Gang of Four. Uh, it's not my term. Um, if you Google it, it'll probably come up as a rock band. But Eric Schmidt coined the <laughs> phrase, <laughs> yeah. Good a gang of four. Good and that was just easier. Uh, Fast Company. Has anyone seen Fast Company this month? Right, The Fab Four, yeah. right? who's going to win in the tech war of 2012? Um, so the gang of four is really doing, individually and collectively, just some absolutely amazing things. And we can go down the list. But perfect example, and one that I cite quite a bit, is Amazon. And they're absolutely fascinating. Um, if you think about what they've done since 1994 when Jeff Bezos founded an online bookstore, it's mind-boggling. He's a smart guy, but I'm pretty sure that he wasn't saying in 1994, and by 2011, I'm, my company's going to make $750 million selling excess cloud computing services, right, primarily to small businesses. But if you look at what they've done historically, they've really use the platform, they added these different planks. So when cloud computing became popular and in demand, they were there to pounce. And if you look at what a lot of companies have done, they've added these individual planks. And that's something that I defined early on in the book, a plank versus a platform. I'm a big fan of uh, Bloomberg West with Emily Chang and uh, Corey Johnson. And I swear, there must be a buzzer on that show. Because every five minutes, someone just blurts a platform. And I feel like it's used inappropriately most of the time. So in the book, I sort of lay out this framework in which there are individual planks of a platform. So if you take a look at Google in 1998, I would argue it wasn't a platform. It was an incredibly useful and powerful search engine. Right? Does anyone remember AltaVista and Lycos and Yahoo? And you would search and go, what, what is this? 
right? So Google was an incredibly useful search engine, but it wasn't a platform. It has become a platform by adding the different planks. You know, Gmail and Google Maps and Reader and News and, and, and Android and all these different things. So one of the things that I've had some pretty heated arguments with people about uh, in a few interviews I've done since the book came out, it only came out last week, is whether or not a small business or a large one can learn from these massive companies with billions in revenue. And I say yes, because I've done it. So one of the other things that I think I want to talk about, and then I'll let Adrian speak, is that these four companies are really consumer oriented. And I know Adrian's going to talk a bit about this. If you look, this notion of a technology platform isn't new, and I'm not saying that it is, right? You know, Microsoft had built a platform, IBM. But these are all very consumer oriented ones, and everyone knows about the consumerization of IT. It is a better place to be, I think, in the consumer space. In fact, it used to be, if you go back to the mid-90s, what I call Enterprise 1.0, the best technology was in the workforce. And now, not across the board, but invariably I will go into some of my consulting clients and my iPhone trumps what these people are using to do their actual work, and it's scary. So if you look at what these companies have done, it's nothing less than fascinating. And I was unaware of a book that looked at the platform as a business model, and Adrian was so helpful in sort of being a sounding board and laying things out and helping me almost as sort of a secondary editor. Um, and we agreed on a lot of things, but not on, on everything. <laughs> and I think that this is my boldest, most ambitious book. Um, the, uh, people are either going to love it or are going to hate it. It's not anodyne. This is not another social media book. It's about a different way of doing business. And you're either going to think I'm a genius or I'm an idiot. And I can live with that because <laughs> <laughs> I just think that the way that many companies have been doing business is not really tenable in the future. Next month, I'm speaking to 150 government folks in Washington, D.C. And the challenge will be how do I not irritate them? Because if anyone in the room thinks that their way of doing business is going to remain the same, I think they're insane. You're not going to have the same budget. You're not going to ha have the same headcount. So how can you thrive in this age of the platform? Um, that was really what was driving my thinking. There are four companies out there that are just absolutely killing it. And if you look at what other companies are saying about them, Microsoft's a great example. Right? Does anyone sort of see the challenge or the pr potential inconsistency of a company that with 10 years ago was trumpeting the values of the free market right? when it was being sued for bundling IE with Windows is now wanting the government to sue because Google has monopoly in search, right? <laughs> so you know, the AOLs and Yahoos and MySpaces of the world would love to have the problems of Facebook and Amazon and Apple and Google. So those are just some of the things that I talk about in the book. But again, this notion of a platform isn't new, but consumers are driving a lot of it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Adrian. Great. Thanks, Phil. I wanted to congratulate Phil on an absolutely fantastic book. I had an opportunity to read all the early galleys of it, and uh, we did have some good debates, but I think we both came together on many things, and it's, it's tremendous ideas, and it really speaks to what's going on in today's environment. And um, that's actually why I suggested him to the ASAP organization, because um, it's so uh, relevant. It's amazing what you can get people to do when you put their name on the cover of your book. The carrot is better than the stick. That's a good one too. Well, it didn't go on there lightly, so it, it's uh, well deserved, and uh, you, it definitely has done a great job. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and stand up because I have some slides to share with you, and I don't sit very well. <laughs> so I thought what I'd do is um, share with you some frameworks and slides uh, from my book to help us get some background and start to think about the age of the platform. And we're going to talk a little bit about how the Gang of Four fits in, but also we're going to talk about some other examples as well. We won't get into a lot of detail on that tonight because we're going to go into those in more detail in further Game Changer series, but wanted to uh, just give you some framing on how to think about the age of the platform. So how many of you feel that your life is driven by your schedule and you make so many decisions based on how much time and your time constraints? I, ha I suffer from that too, and that is what inspired me to write The 24-Hour Customer. The 24-hour customer, really, uh, the premise of it really has to do with the fact that I believe that business has moved from production-centric kind of economy, that, and we've moved to a customer-in-control 
type of economy. The customers are starting to make decisions. The customers are deciding who they want to do business with. And so when you start to think about it from the customer-centric view, I started to think about, OK, so if we're looking at it from that perspective, what are the constraints in that environment? What are the things that make them and drive their decisions? How do they decide whether to go with one product or service or another? And so this is what drove some of the frameworks that I built in the 24-hour customer. How do we start to think about, about that as businesses? And then how does that drive the kinds of ecosystems and strategies that we want to build out for our businesses to basically serve the 24-hour customer? So I'm going to share with you uh, one of the frameworks. It's a timographics framework. It's a way to think about things when it comes to the customer. We triage products and services every day. Think about the time and attention you'll spend on a business decision and the time and attention you'll spend picking socks out in the morning. Or how you look at things and you say, this isn't worth my time. But then there's other things you get addicted to, right? Can anybody name something that you get addicted to, you spend a lot of time with? Facebook. Facebook, yes! Nobody wants to admit it, but yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry? Reading, reading books. Reading books. So there are things oh, that we like. Uh, we like to spend time with our families, <laughs> like right? So, so it's interesting. Um, I get a lot of people commenting on my book. They go, oh, I get your book. It's all about saving time for the customer. And I say, well, that's not really what the book is, is about. It's about aligning your business, your ecosystem with how the customer values time relative to your offering. So you're aligning with the customer, not necessarily saving them time. Because look at Facebook. The strategies that they pursue are very different than, say, uh, if you're in the post office and want the line to be very short. So the, uh, what you have here up on the board here is a framework that I built called the Timographics Framework. You can think of it as being like demographics, but it has to do with time. On the x-axis, we have propensity to spend time. You can think of, you know, do we want to spend time? It's also a proxy for importance in our lives. So it can be a background process in our life that's very important, um, and, and it takes time. Things like banking services fit into that category on the importance scale. On the y-axis, we have propensity to allocate attention. So do we want to spend Devote attention to it, do we not? And we make those decisions all the time. So this is a four-quadrant model that will help uh, set the framework for tonight's discussion. We have first the time magnet quadrant. And those are the things that we get addicted to. So those are, tend to be driven by motivations. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the triggers that, that Facebook uses to get us to spend more time there. And it, they're very calculated about it, and it's, it, it's, a, it's a keen strategy that they use. The second quadrant is the time savers. Now, this is what you typically think about when you think about the 24-hour customer. You think, oh, they want to save time. But not every customer wants convenience, as we saw in the case of Facebook. There's time minimized. So we go to the grocery store, and we make decisions all the time. But it's like enough to look at the price and move on. It's based on value or maybe one or two other functions, but we really don't have enough hours in a 24-hour day with 16 waking hours of attention to spend on that. And then lastly, we have what I call the habit quadrant, or it's time on autopilot. These are things where we're spending time on it, or it's time that's happening in the background for us, say some systematic kinds of processes that are happening in our business or in our personal lives. And these are things that we really don't want to pay attention to. We just want them to work. So banking is, a, is probably my best example in that. We, we just want it to work. We don't want to spend a lot of time, but it's very important to us. We don't want the bank to mess up. And so um, just to add to that, uh, if you look at time on autopilot and habits, psychologists have found that we spend about 45% of our day, almost half of our day, in routine and habitual behaviors. So if you can tap into that habitual behavior with the consumer, they're just going to keep buying from you. And so this is where we see a lot of subscription services and things like that. We forget to turn them off. And, and so it's a very powerful 
kind of uh, platform. So when we start to talk about the Gang of Four and how they fit into this framework, most of the Gang of Four, most of their offerings fr as, from a portfolio perspective fit into the time magnet quadrant. More time is more money. Now if you look at, uh, let's think about Facebook. If people decided not to go on Facebook tomorrow, what would happen to the value of Facebook? Plummet, right? Because their business model is all about having you spend time there. And so they have a business model, their advertising models, trying to get you there and keep you there. So this is why you see them building out partnerships on things that will get you to spend more time. They have games, they have a college, you can even get a college degree on Facebook. I mean, they want you to live on that platform, right? Uh, video Skype is a great example. They were missing it. They didn't want people to go away. Right. Absolutely. They want you to stay there. So they're doing everything they can. They brought search in with Bing. They just don't want you to leave. And so uh, this phenomenon I call time wars because, as you know, there's 24 hours in a day. And there's actually an article I wrote for Fast Company but there's some copies out in the hallway, but if, you, if there's none left, uh, you can check it out on, just look under my name on Fast Company, or um, you can just send me an email, I can send it to you. But um, it's about time wars, and it's basically how these companies are battling it out for time. So actually, uh, Microsoft's move to partner with Facebook is masterful because they, they did not want to partner with Google because that would take people off and send people to Google. It's all about trying to keep you on that platform. Now, um, there's some other platform strategies that are also viable. I know a lot of marketers think, oh, you have to do the time magnet. That's the only way. But there are also other viable strategies that work in the marketplace. So um, one of the things that uh, Sherrick's going to talk about in a little bit is about the Salesforce social enterprise and some of the chatter offerings that they're doing. That requires time and attention of the customer. And so the strategies that you pursue there are going to be, in, ter in terms of the partners you bring on, are going to be different. Now on time on autopilot, these are more subscription and maintenance renewal kinds of businesses. And the goal on autopilot is you want to be very quiet with the customer. You don't necessarily care if they spend time with you. In fact, you don't want them to spend time with you because they might be asking about your subscription. <laughs> <laughs> so you think of what happened with Netflix, right? People woke up and said, my gosh, I'm spending this money every month. I'm going to start thinking about alternatives. And so what you want to do in that kind of environment, and this is where, um, particularly in the B2B environment, if you're, say, Salesforce CRM or if you're uh, SAP, you're, you'll see the partner networks uh, expanding in terms of different types of applications and how do you embed into that customer environment, such that the switching costs are high so that it's not just a price in terms of switching costs, it's the time and effort it would take to move to a competitive platform. So you want to embed when you, you're thinking from that perspective. Um, there's two others, and I'm going to go fairly quickly because I'm short on time and we'll get into these in future sure. events. But uh, time savers are traditional, what you think of convenience. And what you're doing in that case for a platform is you're trying to, uh, you want to think about your business as a flow chart and you want to cut steps out of the flow chart, so you're going to look for partners that are going to help you reduce that. FedEx is a great example. They're looking at ways to do that. The risk in that kind of business environment is that uh, you uh, run the risk of disruption in that environment if something faster comes along. We've seen that happen a lot, right? And then lastly, uh, time minimized, you'll see things like loyalty programs. And you'll see things where they're saying, gee, you know, uh, stay with our loyalty program, buy four, get one free, you get more discount, things like that. Those, that's a platform as well. And that's what you see in the time minimized and the products and services that fit into that. So in terms of building the ecosystem, there are five triggers, five Ps that I've identified that you want to think about when you're building out that ecosystem. Uh, for a time magnet, you want to look at consumer and business triggers having to do with peers and power and personal pursuits. So great example there is uh, you think about how Facebook, when Facebook sends you a notice in your email and says you haven't been on for a while, 
or LinkedIn, what do they say? They don't say, gee, we miss you, because you say, too bad, I don't care. Your friends, thank you, your friends have sent you messages, right? So that's a great example of peers in power. They're, they're tapping into the peers in power. Um, there's a, um, the other thing is, you, when you see the, the air badges, the things you see on gamification, are you guys familiar with gamification and some of the techniques that are going on where people get badges for things? And this works great in the B2B environment as well as the B2C. People want to look good. They send you notices, say they're playing um, Farmville and they're saying, help me, see, look at my great farm. And I don't play Farmville, but there's things that even in the B2, even in the B2B space you see that because uh, you may want have training programs at work and people are certified to do certain things. People want to be recognized and that's part of the peers in power that you're tapping into for those kind of projects. Personal pursuits are things that we like to pursue. They're fun, games, curiosity, spending time with family. Oh, I'm sorry, spending time with family is peers in power, but uh, 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 making yourself healthier, things like that. Learning, those are all personal pursuits. Um, what's actually interesting about what the Gang of Four is doing in today's environment in this and, and tapping into these triggers is they're building on um, techniques that were devised in the court of Louis XIV. And these were all done in the 1700s. It's actually funny, Louis was well known for throwing a great party. He was a party guy. So a lot of people said, oh, the guy's just a partier. But he was actually very wise. This was during a time when kings and queens were losing their head. And Louis actually threw great parties and kept his court so busy with all of these activities and getting badges and, and uh, st uh, symbols of status that they didn't have time to overthrow the king. Louis was actually pretty smart. <laughs> he had fun while doing it, too. So people were having so much fun that they didn't realize that they didn't have time to overthrow him. Louis XIV is the longest reigning monarch in Europe. And so it's a very smart strategy. And so when you look at what a lot of the Gang of Four are doing today, a lot of the techniques, they're tapping into those techniques. You've heard of the term RSVP, right? That came out of the court of Louis XIV. Respondez-vous s'il vous plaît? It was a way for Louis to tap into people and know where they were. And similarly, when you get the notifications from all the internet providers, that's a way for them to get you to respond. You have notifications on Facebook. Guilty reminders. Works wonders. So those are some of the first two Ps. Um, the other Ps, uh, time savers, have to do with productivity. Uh, time minimized has to do with price. We talked about that in loyalty programs. And then the last trigger to think about as you start to think about how to strengthen your platform has to do with what I call prairie dog events. You're familiar with prairie dogs, right? They're little animals in the Midwest that pop their head up and look around. Well, imagine what happened when Netflix announced their price increase, right? Everybody went, oh my gosh, I'm paying too much. Or when your telco does that, or your bank does that. So the idea is when you're in the time on autopilot segment or the habit quadrant, you want to manage those prairie dog events. And it is a great opportunity from a competitive standpoint that if your competitors have a prairie dog event, you might, that would be an opportune time to go and go after those customers because it's the, those points in time that people are most willing to switch. So those are the triggers. Hopefully uh, this will give you a little bit of background for the rest of what we're going to talk about tonight. And um, I just wanted to uh, mention that really has to do not so much with saving the customer time, but how the customer values time and linking your ecosystem in with that. Can I just say that I spend way too much time on Facebook because I didn't even know you could get that email. <laughs> <laughs> Could we actually back up to where we have the uh, sales force and the social enterprise? Sure. There. So um, as, as we turn to Sharik, um, I, I think, I think uh, the framework is useful 
in a way that we want to bring out right now, which is we're all, many of us are in the business of designing business strategy, um, designing the parameters that go into it, designing the stakeholders and the partnerships that have to go into it. And we can look at it in classical ways based upon value chain, um, uh, but m as more and more of the world is digitally uh, communitized, if you'll allow me to use a word, what is becoming clearer is that you do not have uh, um, a product portfolio or a service portfolio. You have your product or service portfolio and then a community of ecosystems that are going to keep that vibrant. And um, the segue to Salesforce is when, when someone says Salesforce today, right? S Salesforce is not a large company vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Amazon, which is at 72 billion, and will, by 2015, will be the fastest company in the history of the world to hit 100 billion. Or Apple, which is at 100 billion with 80 billion in, in war chest reserves. Yet, the gravitas of Salesforce, whether it be SaaS, whether it be around employee-to-employee -employee collaboration, will it be around energizing very large communities to say, I'm with them. I don't know where they're going to take it, but I'm going to bet on them um, in, in their fast growth mode. Shows that it doesn't matter where you are in the form of size, you can fall. Microsoft has struggled for quite some time and will probably regain a, a, a champion status in time, but it has struggled for a long time. And yet, when Might one, when, oh, oh, okay. And when one, but one talks about Salesforce today, there's no doubt about it. They have a strategy, they have a platform, they are transparent with their communities, um, and they are expanding the number of communities that they're able to engender. So with that, Sherrick, you, you are involved in this. How mm -hmm. does Salesforce look at the market today and what else it can do? That's a good question. Uh, I Kind of want to start with uh, polling the audience. So, and, and actually to kind of see how much you know about Salesforce. How many of you use database.com, which is a new offering we just announced? Anyone? Okay. How many of you use force.com, the platform? Okay. How many of you use the traditional salesforce.com CRM products? All right. So actually, all of you use the force.com platform. And all of you use actually database.com. Uh, all of our applications are built leveraging the platform. So every single API, every single object, et cetera, that's in the platform that you would use to build your own custom apps, we use to build our own applications as you use today. Same with the database. So we've abstracted the database, and the database now is a platform. And so every single user of Salesforce, the traditional CRM products, is actually a user on those platforms today. Now, every single application, you talk about ecosystems and communities. The App Exchange is a great example of where we have millions of applications that are built on the platform. And they're available through an exchange, very much like the, uh, the, the Apple Store, the App Store, where you can go in, you can find out about them, you can rate them, you can learn about them, et cetera, and then you can download them and use them and you can go buy them. Um, and these applications are anything from you know, the simplest of, you know, tweaking or cleaning your lead database to uh, CA and Ariba and BMC who have written new applications on the platform for them to commercially resell to, to their customers. So that element of the platform now is taking the platform and trying to reach out into a community, um, which is, I would say, you know, we've really ramped that up in the last two years and now we're in the millions of apps and it's quite successful and, and, and uh, uh, frankly a lot of fun because it, we get to engage with a lot of, not just customers, but also software companies building on the platform. Sure. Do you want to list some of the categories? Because I actually list them in the book here, and I was amazed researching force.com at the, 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 the variety of, of applications people have built. Yeah, I mean, it's from HR to procurement. I mean, things you wouldn't even think about being associated with Salesforce, right? Who thinks of HR when you think of Salesforce? You think about selling. HR's in there, procurement's in there. Um, you got a few more. <laughs> you got a few more, yeah. <laughs> you can read them if you want. But, um, Supply chain is actually another one, uh, PLM. I mean, there's just all sorts of apps um, that are going in there today. Um, I did want to touch on, though, there's sort of another layer of platform, which is uh, the social platform. 
And today, in the social environment, you know, everything is social, social, social. And Adrian, you brought up a good point. It's all about the, the, the consumer, right? It's all about the individual. It's no longer about the corporation. You don't, you don't build apps for the corporation to, uh, to, to build something, produce something, and then hopefully your customers will buy it, right? It's paying attention to the individual. And in today's social environment, you gotta pay attention to that individual in their social world. So what is their social profile? And that's a new trend or a new wave we've taken Salesforce and our customers. And it's becoming a social enterprise. And it's not the company becoming social because that's, you know, okay, you could tweet inside your company. It's paying attention to the, the individual and their social needs. So, for example, what is, a, what is an individual doing on Twitter? What are, what are they saying about you on Facebook? What are they doing about you in your online uh, community, et cetera? and paying attention to that. Because it's, it's amazing, to even today, how many CEOs are flabbergasted when they see that people are actually talking about them on, on Twitter, or talking about them on Facebook. Even B2B companies, right? You could be building tractors or vacuum cleaners for big offices or whatever. And I guarantee you, there is a conversation about that company going on somewhere in that environment. So you have to pay attention to the public social networks about your customer and what those individuals are doing and saying about you. You have to today, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, you, your customer support line is what, number 10 on the list of priorities of what people want, to, how they want to interact with you. They want to hear you from Twitter, they want to talk to you on Facebook. So you have to be doing that around the individual and what they're doing. Um, and then how do you collaborate to service that individual, right? So you take a look at um, whether you're gonna uh, sell to them, where you're gonna service them, um, what's that 360 degree view? What's the social profile of that customer? And how do you collaborate within your company, so an internal social network, around servicing that customer? And I mean, at times it's 24 by seven, right? It's not just, you can't think of servicing a customer as your call center anymore. Again, it's one of 10 different ways to service your customer. Um, I had a great uh, interaction with uh, Comcast, who happens to be a Salesforce customer, where I was tweeting something negative about them. Um, <laughs> just happened to be, this was years ago, so they've done much better, but you know, I, I piled onto someone else's tweet, and sure enough, you know, Comcast, who's been a leader in terms of Twitter and service, service management, got right back to me, you know, what can we do, or how can we help, et cetera. Um, two months later, I actually had to call them, because something had gone down, you know, Comcast is great, but some things, things go wrong. I called them, and the, the customer service agent said, hey, did we ever resolve that post that you did on Twitter? And wow. You know, kind of look at the phone, <laughs> like, wow. Uh, and they had matched up my email from Twitter to my email that's in the account. I mean, that's two segments, right? Today, we can match up 10 to 20 different pieces of your life <laughs> into a social profile about you, though. So we understand, what are you saying about us? What are you doing about us? Are you influential? So you might turn that around and go, well, there's these 100 influential people that maybe we want to market to as opposed to just service. So paying attention to that social profile is very key. And, it's, um, and that's, that's how you get customers into being a social enterprise. Um, and then lastly, it's how do you build the innovative apps then that really pay attention to the customer? So it's the iPad, right? Um, we are asked every single day by customers, how do we integrate the iPad? How, what do we do with the iPad? And every single day we are building new apps that tie right into our platform but go in, and interact directly with customers. Whether you're selling and you've got price lists, you're servicing and you're, you're writing up invoices, whatever it is, the iPad now is engaged in that conversation with the consumer. Um, so that's just one device, right? There's mobile, there's of course Cisco has their own devices which are I'm sure fantastic. Um, but it's, it's those innovative apps that weren't possible 18 months ago, right? Um, that are not just mobile, but they're also social. So that um, gamification is involved, right? Gamification is a, is a part of being social. It's, you know, when you go to someone's website now to go get service, you can win badges and you can have prizes. You get on a top 10 list and guess what? Now next thing you know, you've been there for 10 minutes and you're like, I came here to get help. Now I'm winning badges, <laughs> uh, but it's addictive. <laughs> and so all the elements of social are into these apps and they've never been around before. And so. Um, that's what we talk about. We talk about the social enterprise and it's really paying attention to that individual and how we, uh, how you service them as a corporation. Can I jump in here for a sec? Sure, please. And that's probably one of the reasons you guys bought Radiant 6, right? Absolutely. We, we, they were, the, and still are of course, the leading social media monitoring tool to help you take that fire hose of information. Because if you think about everything that's going on in Twitter and Facebook and the, the blogosphere, et cetera, 
And how do you monitor that? How do you find out what's going on about Comcast every single second of the day? And it's been a fantastic move for us because it really ties into the social enterprise piece of how to, how to truly service and sell to and look at that individual customer um, in the social media world. Mm -hmm. And that makes so much sense because if I'm, whether I'm a big company or a small company, I'm thinking about my choice of platforms because no disrespect to force.com and Salesforce, but it's not certainly the only one. Right. But if you've got all of the planks, why do I want to go someplace else? And I yeah. can build new ones. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what we've tried to do with the platform is, is include things into it. So it's not just, it's, you're not just getting a box or a server or whatever, you're getting things built into it. So you get access to the social elements. So when you build an app on, on force.com, you get the feed that you get in, in Chatter. So if, you, if any of you use Salesforce and use Chatter, the feeds, the groups that look and act a lot like Facebook, I wonder why, 700 million people prove you right. Um, it's a good model to follow. So you take that, but that, and then offer that in the platform so that when you go build your own app, you don't have to rebuild that, right? You don't have to build groups. You don't have to build follow. You don't have to write your own follow button. Um, you don't have to build the feed and the security that goes behind that and the privacy and everything else. It's all there. So you build your app. You've already made it social without having to build anything new, and it's laid out for you. Right. Then you tie in, eventually we'll tie in social media monitoring into that, and there's more and more and more that you want to offer as part of that platform. Right. And the interesting thing, at least from my perspective, and John, we talked about this uh, at lunch, it doesn't have to be the best of breed social plank or tool. If it's good enough, why do I want to go outside of it? Not saying that it isn't the best of breed, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. You don't have to cobble together a bunch of disparate parts with a whole bunch of spaghetti architecture. Everything's on force, Yeah. right? right. Good point. Isn't this just Microsoft Office redo? I mean, Harvard Graphics was best of breed, you know, Borland's Paradox was best of breed, but Microsoft hmm. put the suite together and you could transfer things between apps and... Where, so, um, I'll give you a short answer. And then Can we'll everybody hear that question? So, so the question was, like isn't, this, isn't this the Microsoft Redux in terms of bringing a best of breed a, a portfolio of applications that, are not that well, they're fun yeah, they're functionally acceptable. Exactly. I, th I think the, the the net difference will be that Microsoft did so with a um, a transactional view, um, a subscription oriented view, and only that they could lock in. Um, in today's world, the brand is constantly evolving. The point of planks. And another term, if, you, if you're able to take a look at uh, Phil's book, he gets into outposts. The, f the ability to say, we'll project a platform as a kernel. You will build upon it you, towards your tailoring it to your interests. And then we will um, expose that for leverage, cross leverage, if you, if you want to um, build a, a player wants to build their own community on the, on the platform itself. But we don't have a determinate view of, of, of how this is going to work out economically. And I think that that's the paradigm shift in this, in this, with respect to this question. I love that the question came out because it's about the right time when we begin to say, let's bring them on. So John. Yes, indeed. Uh, I have one more question for the, the panel in order to start to kind of transfer uh, uh, questions that we would love to hear and engage with from the from the audience. I'd like everybody to start thinking, uh, if if you would, uh, about how this relates to your own companies and your own careers. Where, wherever you are in the learning curve, wherever you are in terms of uh, your segmentation within the industry, what can can you give some advice or some thoughts about? A, two or three of the key things that people ought to be thinking about uh, in terms of engaging with social media uh, and platforms? Well, it's, it's obviously a very important plank. There's a reason that Google Plus spent, I don't even know how much money. Did they make that available on Plus? It was a lot. How much they spent on it? Yeah, right? And remember, this is Google's fourth bite at the apple. Right. right. You had uh, Orkut, which was only big in Brazil, which I still don't know why. <laughs> uh, and actually, I have a friend from Brazil. I asked him. He said, I have no idea. Um, second was uh, Wave, and then you had Buzz. So social is important. I think it was uh, Adrian who was saying the, the, the social component of things it really cannot be understated. You want to give people an incentive to ma maintain their own information. 
right? Um, it's one of the reasons I think Yah um, Yahoo is not doing so well in MySpace ultimately failed, right? You know, what is deadhead stoner 999, right? Who is that person, right? You want to be able to individually identify people and incentivize them to maintain their own information. Personal example, I just moved three months ago from New Jersey to Las Vegas. I want Amazon to have my updated mailing address, right? Amazon can instantly produce an accurate list of customers. That makes them so valuable. I was, at, I was speaking at a conference about a month ago, and the CEO, uh, Tony Fisher of Dataflux, who was the keynote um, there, mentioned that it takes the average company two days to produce a list of customers. And I'll bet you that that list of customers is fraught with inconsistencies and inaccuracies and has duplicate and missing information. And you're talking about a much smaller list than how many customers does Amazon have? Does anyone even know? <laughs> so. It, so I, I think that the social element is really important, and that's why I, I, when I saw that Fast Company article, I don't think that one of the four will win. I think that Facebook will mm -hmm. add some different planks, but I can't see it competing with Google when it comes to search. Right? Again, I can't predict the future, but they're just too strong there. And we saw what happened, and Adrian, we talked about this last week on the phone call, what happens when a company like Microsoft tries to play Me Too, which historically has been very uh, successful for them, but I think that that, that, that sort of ship has sailed. It, before I turn it over to Adrian, I just wanted to uh, comment to Carolyn's question. I think there's some overlap with the best of breed in the Microsoft Office suite, but I think the difference between that and what, what Sherrod's talking about with Force.com is that you have this vibrant community. You have, correct me if I'm wrong, open APIs. Right. So you have people out there that can develop things. If I wanted to develop in Microsoft Office back in the day, and I'm a geek, I spent a lot of time doing development, I can create my own access database, I can customize the GUI of Excel, but those are kind of standalone apps. I mean, the community at large is maybe just doing it inside versus making an app available right, for others, correct? Mm -hmm. So I think that the reason Forest.com can grow a lot faster, and I don't want to say better, but do things quicker, is that you have how many tens of thousands or millions of people with access to that yeah. and the, the no, software no. development yeah. kits versus submitting to Microsoft the feature request going, please, for Office version, blah, 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 can you change these annoying ribbons? Do you, do you think <laughs> if the same situation had occurred now, when the net is available, I mean, if there, there was this block, this inability to have the users say, you know, Office is second best, or, you know. But what was the other choice, I guess? Microsoft could afford not to do that much innovation-wise, right? Those because. Word perfect. A lot of people swore by that. Okay, but they swore by Microsoft Word Perfect. Microsoft had a bigger, bigger box to spend on squelching. Mm -hmm. So I the best of breed didn't, didn't necessarily win at that time, but you wonder now if they would have been able to get away with it. Maybe, but it, there was no rating and right. it was all had to filter through the editorial community that did the product reviews, and, and it was right. very much controlled by budget. Right, but to John's point, things are more social now because, yeah, and totally. again, you know more about Force.com than I do, but if something's popular, just like an app with Angry Birds, Right. No one could have predicted that that was going <laughs> yeah, to be yeah, exactly. downloaded how many millions of times. But it's, it's Chris Anderson's The Long Tail. If you put enough apps, I have an app in the App Store for my last book, The New yeah. Small. Trust me, it's nowhere near downloaded as much as Angry Birds. But if you put enough apps out there right, in the App Store and Force.com, something is going to become really popular. And people will take it in different directions. I think that's a big difference between Microsoft. But I'll defer to uh, Adrian. Well, I, I think, uh, Phil, to, to your point, I, I think one of the challenges, um, particularly when you get into the time magnet qu quadrant, is what happens with customers is we get attention and entropy, right? Mm -hmm. We follow something for a while, we use an app for a while, and then we move off. And so um, some of the differences that are going on today, a lot of apps are free. So the switching costs, and we, you know, we have something that works, well, I'm going to go try something else. Angry Birds is now, and then we're going to try something later. This is why um, when you're in the time magnet quadrant, um, you'll typically see companies like Disney, Apple, people like that, because they're masters at continuing to capture the attention. And this is one of the things that I think a lot, I hear a lot of companies saying, I want to be social, I want to do this. But trying to capture people's attention, especially, you know, if you're a me too, if people are already on something and there's inertia, say I'm already on Facebook and you're trying to get me to go on a different platform, a social networking platform, that's a difficult call because people will say, gosh, you know, I'm already here, my friends are here, peers in power, you can see, you can see how these things become very sticky. But we lose interest over time, and this is one of the challenges that has to happen when you are the gang of four. They're going to have to continue to innovate, and they're on this 
very fast roll. And this is why, you know, Disney is, I think of them as the epitome of the time magnet. They are so good at just continuing to roll out things that keep our attention. But not every company is good at that. And not every company is rolls that way. And so I think one of the things when you're building out these platforms, you really have to ask yourself, do we have the capability in-house to do that? And so I see a lot of companies saying, gosh, we're going to go social. But it, it takes a lot of investment and it takes different skill sets than maybe if you're down in the time on autopilot quadrant. I think it's a cultural thing too. I mean, it, it's, it's a culture of delighting the user, right? Facebook was not the first social network, right? But their entire focus, no matter what, you know, forget all revenue possible, it's about the end user and that was their thing. And so their culture was about innovating for that end user experience. Google, um, Google has got a very, I don't know, call it lucky, for fortunate in that the stuff they do around Google Plus, or a lot of the innovation they do, doesn't actually have to generate revenue because they have this huge cash cow that just funds innovation. So they, they're very fortunate that way. And as long as that cash cow is going, you're gonna see great innovation because I think they like to delight the user too. I think um, they, like to, they, they like to innovate and they've got, uh, they've got the cash to do it. Um, Apple, poster child for delighting the user. Um, so I think it's, um, and I think that's the difference from you know, many years ago with, with Microsoft. Are you trying to lock in people so that you're capturing the revenue or are you really, truly interested in delighting the user? Um, you know, it's one of the things that we've, we've tried to do is we do three releases a year. I mean, that's for enterprise software is kind of crazy. Um, sometimes it drives our users crazy uh, because we're literally c rolling out new stuff three times a year. But our engineers, I don't know, many years ago said, look, we're gonna get so innovative and we're gonna roll out such stuff and we're gonna delight the user so much until they cry uncle because we just <laughs> wanna push this out. Now, you don't have to take it, right? You switch it on and switch it off. So it's actually up to the individual whether they wanna use it or not. You could turn off chatter if you want. Um, but the point is to push up as much as possible and keep going after and keep trying to delight the user, that's a cultural thing. And I think, um, I'm not sure Microsoft necessarily had that or maybe they did back in the day. Um, but I think that's within every company, you've got to look at that. It's how are you delighting that user? I mean, I, again, you're selling farm equipment. How are you delighting that guy sitting, you know, mowing crops? What's delighting that, that user? Um, and that's a game changer to me in terms of uh, culture shift in companies. And, and Sherrick, if I could paraphrase what you said, the difference between what you're talking about is maybe people use Microsoft products because they had to. Now people are using these platforms because they want they to. Want to. Well, right. I think that's yeah, a huge difference. Well, what's going well, well, on is the, uh, the paradigm shift in terms of the focus. The focus was the enterprise with Microsoft and all these other companies and the IT, uh, the IT right. management structure to be able to provide standardized, uh, uh, serviceable uh, so software and platforms so that, so that the companies could run efficiently. The focus has totally shifted right. to the end user. Well, this is where Adrian and I have had some spirited debates, and there's this notion in the book, and I didn't coin the term of the prosumer. So it mm -hmm. used to be a consumer, used to be in the enterprise. Well, now you're, you're really both. <laughs> and uh, in, uh, the, the new platforms that I talk about in the book are mostly consumer-oriented. I agree with you. And it's a lot easier, I think, if you want to deploy an app over <coughs> an iPad or a mobile device versus having IT involved in a six-month procurement process and everyone has to have IT at their desktop to install something and call help. It, it is very different. I agree with you. So excellent. We're, we're already into questions from the audience, and that's what we want. And questions that you have about how it engages you or uh, just things that you want to understand better. I think you've done a wonderful job, and thank you for helping us uh, understand in more depth what the, what the paradigm is that we're talking about. So let's open it up, and we plan to spend uh, a fair amount of time. It's your show. Um, we have microphones. Let's let's see if we need them um so let's let's just start who's got the first question so perhaps we can talk a little about b2b mm -hmm. and and how these Excellent. notions apply to b2b because we heard about salesforce and and uh extending beyond an enterprise into some social Are can everybody can everybody hear that yeah. okay <laughs> B2B platforms? 
I, mean, well, I think the conversation, a lot of this conversation has been around B to C. And yeah. I think one of the questions, and it's one of the questions that I've had, Adrian and I have discussed a, a bit, in, in, as well as Phil, is how, do, how, do, how does this paradigm apply to B to B? To B? Mm -hmm. I think you need to change the distribution. Genentech's a great example. They have an internal app store, right? They're basically saying we want people to be able to just click and download an app that's there on their mobile device or their, their iPad. That's, I think, something we're going to see more of in the future. But that's still business to their, it's internal to the business. Enterprise mm -hmm. to enterprise is most of B2B. Mm -hmm. How does that work? I think these all apply to B2B. Um, I think there is, as we've seen, for example, with Salesforce, there's taking some consumer oriented concepts like social media and bringing them back into B2B kind of environments and applying those to B2B environments. But also there's clear B2B examples. I mean FedEx, you know, that's a lot of B2B. They sell a lot to B2B. Um, uh, there are other examples in all of these, all of these quadrants that fit there. Um, banking, telco services, uh, ERP is a great example of time on autopilot. You know, a lot of times people, they get embedded in the corporation and trying to get them out, <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard to get them out because of the time and effort it would take to, to uh, replace that. And so um, that's an example of where you want to expand and build out your ecosystem so that you're further embedding into those business processes and becoming that maintenance renewal kind of company. So you want to add on with partners that will enable you to um, either gain more maintenance revenue or ensure that uh, the disruption to your platform is not going to change within that customer environment. So that's, that's a good example. Yeah, we, you know, when we release Chatter, so it's an internal social network, right? So sales could talk to service, you could talk to the CEO, et cetera. Um, what happened was the number one new feature request was how do I talk outside? How do I talk to my customers? How do I talk to my partners? How do I, how do we integrate that? Wow, did that become you know quite a big buzz within our company, and a huge privacy issue because you're talking about customer data and your chatter around that, and then trying to integrate that to someone else's environment. And we pride ourselves so much on privacy and security and everything else. So it was a huge challenge for the engineering guys, and they just they went right at it. And, and sure enough, uh, I think in the, actually this release. We have chatter to chatter, or org to org communication is what we call it. So companies can talk to other companies and interact through that social network. Um, and so that's how now you can begin to converse socially between business to business. And uh, we, you know, thank, thankfully it worked out pretty well, but we didn't even think about it when we first came out with chatter. We just thought people needed to talk within the company. And sure enough, you're right on, which is B to B, how do I communicate, so. Just curious, uh, uh, do you use, have you, were you one of those that raised your hand when Chatter was asked? To, uh, do you use Chatter? We use Chatter. We also use PRM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another <coughs> right. Mm -hmm. Partner so relationship uh, management. Andy will help a lot there. Too. I, I bring mm -hmm. this up in the context of B two B, and um, if you if you just step back a bit, um, what I see happening with respect to these platforms, which yes, they are consumer driven or they are individually driven is that there is, a, um, there is a birth of new business processes underway. So for example, if you look at how, uh, if you look at how new service innovation is done, you can no longer say that I need to have a gateway-based process to um, incubate, to get into a beta mode, and then get into a, a, a limited trial launch mode. You're wrong. By the time you get it through that gateway process, your service is probably going to be uh, replicated or copied or something just by circumstance by um, another player in the market, either direct competitor or emerging competitor. Instead, you, you, draw, you put the concept, whether it's through chatter, which, which is a reach out, which is saying, do we need to add more functionality in our hire to retire process? And you can put that out to your own firm, like ADP could do such a thing, or you can put it out into ADP. ADP can put it out into their base of clients, right? They have, they have a, a monster base of clients. And they can begin to incorporate not just simple feedback, but robust feedback. And I think that this is where the birth of processes is coming. NPD, new product development, new service development, 
um, there will be a much greater collaboration of how you ingest this information for the sake of having standard services, shared services that businesses will provide. And the number one conversation we have with some of the company, uh, uh, speaking in, in terms of PwC, the number one conversation we have um, from players who are mature in their market is, um, how do I organize my information, stratify what I want to expose to my value chain, and take a, like I'll call it a gravitas role around customer data analytics. Uh, you can look in the life science players, the, the, the pharmas are doing so. Procter & Gamble, if, um, as they have proclaimed for now four years running, that they intend to morph into an entirely digital enterprise. They are saying we're going to vertically integrate from a consumer products player into a retail information provider. The retailers are doing the same thing, but they're saying we're not, we're just going to, whoever does it best, does it best. In the end, it's about supply chain um, throughput, right? So this is, this is why I wanted to make sure that it, there is a very strong business-to-business -business strategy orientation okay, coming around. Question back there is yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that I actually think Microsoft's original customer was the developer, and they did a fabulous job creating a network and a social um, space for developers with MSDN, with, with uh, .NET, mm -hmm. and uh, in, in the yeah, customer development world, the next generation absolutely, platforms, yeah. but, but they I'd did a good job they, with theirs. They had a really good target towards developers. Yeah. Excuse me. We have a question back there? Um, yes. Um, in this war of the gang of war, who will win, or is there some other disruptive force on the horizon that will disrupt all of them? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but what is it? That's a good answer. I like that. I, I think it's silly to say there will be one winner, right? Yeah. I love that fast company piece, but... Yeah, there are, you know, there's this notion in, in the book, I talk about frenemies and cooperation, right? So you can't Google Facebook, right? They cut that off, right? So mm -hmm. at times, Apple, I was just watching on Bloomberg West before I came here, on the new uh, iOS for um, uh, the iPhone 4S, uh, the Gmail app doesn't work, right? right? Now, now, I don't think it's by design and that will be fixed, but they're going to increasingly collide, right? I mean, who knows what will happen with Netflix, but their timing to use agents or could not have been worse because Apple with the iCloud and Google now with YouTube and movies and Ashton Kusher and Madonna and Jay-Z and, and uh, Amazon with now the fire coming. So I think they're going to increasingly compete for people's time because as Adrian points out in the framework, something may be good enough, right? I like spending time on one platform. And as these platforms add planks, for example, with Skype and, and Facebook or with um, Google and Google Plus, they are making it addictive. I, I saw a stat today, 19% of all time spent on the internet is on Facebook. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I started doing the math and you've got 800 million users, right? <laughs> it's, and what, seven billion people on the earth, maybe half, I mean, think about that. One in five minutes spent on Facebook, uh -huh. that's astonishing to me. And if you're spending a minute on Facebook, that's a minute you can't spend on Google. Absolutely. I wanted to add to that in terms of this whole time element. Um, we did some research in the book in terms of how much people, time people actually spend in the, in the procurement mode from a consumer perspective. Um, it's about 28 minutes a day total, and that includes going to the grocery store on average. And when you look at e-commerce, it's six minutes a day. Okay, so you've got the entire world of the internet competing for six minutes a day. And so when Amazon came out with their Kindle, it was brilliant because what they did is they inserted themselves into, from the transaction of six minutes a day into the consumption mm -hmm. of a book. So you moved from being somebody that you may go in and just go see every once in a while to becoming a constant companion. And as you can see with what they're doing with the fire now and how they're expanding that platform, I actually think they haven't gone far enough fast enough yet. I'm really waiting for a lot of the Amazon purchasing stuff to start coming down onto these platforms, onto the fire, and, and because that is a tremendous way for them to really extend themselves into the consumer because people do care. I think you had a Kindle with you today, did I? No. Didn't you? I, somebody I had a Kindle here today. Sorry. But, uh, you know, it's a constant companion. And so mm -hmm. it creates a lot of opportunities. Plus, you can then start tracking the behavior well, of the customer. You know what's customer. interesting? As an, I don't know if you know this, but Amazon now has introduced a couple of things with Kindles and authors. A, you can see who's highlighting and commenting on what in a Kindle. 
So you're, if you're an author, you can know which parts of your book yes. are resonating with people. And they have this thing called an mm -hmm. at-author program, mm -hmm. which is just in beta right now. So you literally can circumvent Twitter. In other words, if you participate, let's say that I go to Twitter at Exponential Edge, which is Adrian's handle, I can ask you a question directly on the Kindle. Now you can choose not to respond, but mm. that is an example of Amazon becoming more social. Is it going to become the next Facebook? I, no, right? But they are, they have the like button. They're trying to make the comments social. You can vote on comments. So right. hint, if anyone wants to vote on the book review for the age of the platform, <laughs> I, uploaded my, I uploaded my video so it will appear. Now, I only gave myself four stars. But again, they are making it social, right? Why did you do that? Because I don't want to be totally arrogant. But, but you know what's interesting? Amazon learns so much about book reviews. They actually have done studies, and they've controlled for things like the length of the book and the popularity of the author and they find that books that have negative reviews sell better all else equal I see some heads nodding than books that have all positive reviews right mm -hmm. because people want to decide for themselves so there is this inherent social component of it and that's why I had to stop writing after 300 pages because this book could have I mean everything we're talking about here could be in the book I mean these companies change so quickly their platforms their planks it's just this really exciting time and people can argue about is this the new Microsoft are they doing things right I, I don't know um, but they're doing something right because look at how well these companies are doing. As we talked about before, Microsoft would love to have Google's problems right now, right? I don't have a crystal ball, but I don't think so. I think because they're in the time magnet quadrant, there's the attention entropy issue. And they are building out their platforms to the extent that people still go to Facebook, to the extent that people spend time there. But look what happened to MySpace. What's my speech? question back there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, question to Sherrick. Uh, you know, you you did a great job of kind of setting the table in terms of kind of the social CRM platform. I'm curious on two fronts. Uh, one is uh, in your bio, you talk about you're driving the future ecosystem for Salesforce. Mm -hmm. Curious about what does that mean? What are your what are your thoughts about how the ecosystem, how you want the ecosystem mm -hmm. of Salesforce to change? What how will it be different? What are your priorities? And then from a, you know, we're all kind of in the partner ecosystem business, you know, you know BD folks here. Um, how do you apply that, kind of answer that question to how you're measured, how your group is measured? There's always trade-offs about what to do in the next quarter versus kind of the vision in the next year. I'm curious specifically, yeah, yeah. as you've come into the, the role here uh, recently, what are the measurements, what are the metrics to measure partners, which is kind of an amorphous yeah. thing uh, we'll to take many companies. First part first, because um, measures are always fun. Uh, so where we want to see the partner ecosystem. So we're, we're looking ahead towards being a $5 billion and then a $10 billion uh, dollar company. And, and what, you know, we're going to look a lot different. I think we already do in 12 months, really. And our partner ecosystem just has to change dramatically. Majority of our partners do Salesforce, CRM implementations, right? Um, We've just recently, in the last two years, started getting people to build apps. So we have a lot of we have a large developer community. In fact, uh, the way we measure the size of our workforce is through certifications. It's the only real way you can measure it because it's something we can control. So we have CRM certifications. So you can be certified as a sales cloud uh, implementer, a service cloud implementer, or a developer. And just last year, the certified developers actually surpassed the certified consultants who do n the normal CRM type stuff. And so that to us was kind of a, a, a view towards that's the direction we want to see because Salesforce is moving towards that platform, right? Are we going to build more things? Are we going to build more apps in general? I don't know. But we're, the more, if you look at the acquisitions we do, if you look at the investments we make, if you look at day two of Dreamforce, it was all about the platform. It's all, that is our future. That market is 10 times the size of our uh, sales cloud market of SFA. So that is our future. Um, our partners need to, you know, look at that, look at that future, look at that social enterprise component, and say, you know, can we service the client in all these different ways? If I can, if I only have the skills to implement Salesforce automation, then I am not going to be included in projects that then tie that into your call center. If I don't understand social media, how am I going to relate how, what Radiant Six does in terms of how they're selling to a customer in terms of the 360 degree view of a customer? Boy, I got to learn social media. Um, what am I doing about mobile? Because now you can't just implement SFA because now they want it on mobile. 
Um, so the, the partners need to learn how to, um, how to grow and quickly is the problem. You can't, you know, this is my three year dream. This is, you're not gonna win projects anymore, especially in the enterprise space, if you do not understand how to do mobile, how to do social, um, and how to do the platform. And so we're constantly pushing our partners, you've gotta learn. Now, the flip side of that is, you also have to then learn to specialize, because if you're a smaller company, if you're, you know, Capgemini, PwC, you can you have that breadth of knowledge and that specialty to, to take on all those different components. What it probably means is you're dra dra grabbing from different parts of the organization. If you're 100 people, 300 people, uh, or 30 people, then you got to specialize. And maybe yeah, I'm very good at mobile. I'm very good at, at social. But that's what I'm going to be good at. And then I'll kind of add on and I'll add on. I'll knock down different bowling pins. Um, but our point is, you cannot be static. You have to be constantly growing. And if you are static, you're just going to get passed by by everyone else. And we see it all the time with a partner who's, they're happy doing what they're doing, they're growing at 20% a year, we're growing at 38%, guess what? 50 partners just passed you by in the last six months. And so we're constantly challenging our partners to grow and look where we're going. And where we're going is everything that's social, um, everything that's mobile. Uh, we're also going very open. So, um, you know, look at Heroku, it's an extremely open environment. Not only do they do uh, Ruby on Rails, they also do Java now. We're going to add more languages. So we're looking to be much more open. So, you know, uh, open source type of development, what are partners doing in that case as well? So that's what we're pushing. Um, from a, a measures perspective, uh, the team I'm on and, and uh, my, my team, if you will, in particular, looks at, because um, I, I do two things. So one is I recruit strategic partners in niches that we don't have, right? So. Uh, we don't have a lot of Radiant 6 partners. There just aren't that many out there. Uh, actually, there are. They're all customers. They're not actually partners. So it's an interesting um, angle we have there. Heroku partners, same thing. Heroku partners don't care about referral fees. They don't care about SFA. They care about building an app and deploying it on a, on a scalable platform. So it's about finding what we're going to recruit and then changing our program to support that. Now, we have short-term needs. So there's short-term measures that we do, which is all around making sure we have the partner ecosystem and capacity in that ecosystem to handle the demand that we have coming. So when you're enterprise software and you're growing at 38 to 50 percent, depending on who you ask, per year, your partner ecosystem, when you have a partner-led model, has to go at least that or faster. And so how are they scaling up? And in a services business, it's very hard to scale that kind of growth organically because you're always looking at the next three months. So any of you guys that are consulting companies out there, I'm sure you understand, it's hard to hire ahead of the curve. Um, it's even harder in the cloud environment, which makes it that much more difficult. You don't deploy someone for 12 months on a cloud project. It's six weeks, right? And then they've got to be built again, and then they've got to be built again. So you're at six weeks, you might be at three months, you might get lucky to have a six month long project, woohoo! But the old ERP on premise where you're out there for 12, 24, 36 months, you've got predictable revenue, that gives you a cash flow that you can invest back in the business. You don't have that with, with cloud computing these days. So, you know, is there an easy answer to that? No, um, but we try to help them. So the other side of my business is we actually invest in partners and actually try to give them cash to help them grow, to add and hire ahead of the curve, hire salespeople, hire and go on demand for their marketing, et cetera. So they can grow their business and grow it faster than the rates are doing it today. So uh, we measure the growth of our ecosystem and that's a big measure for us. We, we measure how we partner together in terms of uh, how we're working on uh, deals together, how we're engaging together with deals together. And we measure a lot around customer satisfaction, actually. So the partners who do implementations with our product, whether it's force.com or it's sales cloud or whatever, we measure the performance from the customer's viewpoint of what they're doing on that. So customer satisfaction is extremely important. Uh, my organization belongs to an organization called Customers for Life. So we don't call it professional services, we don't call it support, we call it customers for life because that. our business model relies on having customers for life. <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, subscription only goes as good as the uh, as a renewal rate and we strive every every year the renewal rate is going up and it's all about, it's, at the end of the day, it's all about delighting the customer but making it a customer for life. And our partners are a huge part of that because if, if they're, they're part of that ecosystem, if they fall down, then we lose a customer. So we have to make sure that they are 
um, doing as good or better than we can do. Sure, that's an interesting contrast because if you take a look at the sort of traditional ERP or CRM implementation, uh, two years, three years, you bought the software, you signed the papers, you wrote a big check, you're mid-project, you, you don't like your consultants, you're not going to kick out the vendor. Right. Right. So those projects got to be uh, obviously very contentious. So I, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. And it is more of this consumer mindset. The same way if I'm a consumer, sometimes it's your energy company. You don't have a choice. Or Comcast is a great example. Where I lived yeah. in New Jersey, I couldn't go to DirecTV. I couldn't get Fios. I had to deal with Comcast, but that was the exception that proved the rule. If I didn't like Amazon's customer service, I could go to another place to get my books. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it is very much this ethos of the customer that is permeating the enterprise. But you can now go other places for your, your voice services, for example. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and voice. Yeah. So, I, I mean, so I, to, to your point, though, too, <coughs> lastly, on s with services, I think as a subscription based company, we are actually more aligned with consulting firms than the old on premise model. Granted, our projects may not be as big today as the old SAP projects, but you have to be successful. We have to make sure you are successful because we rely on that renewal. It's every year. It's not, like you said, buy it and then rip it out 10 years later. You've already paid for it. Uh, we have to have that customer renew and we have to be tightly aligned with our, with our partners to make sure that they do very good implementations. Because you know, consulting companies, same thing, right? You have to have customers for life. Your, your renewal of customers is how you build your book of business. You're not doing a new customer and then throwing them out the window and going in someone new. You're building that same kind of book of business. Um, and we're doing the same thing. So I think it's actually very well aligned as a subscription business. Well, we I have a question over here. Okay. The question is for Phil, uh, especially in the platforms. You know, for all of us which are not part of the gang of four, you know, recommend create planks, create platforms. What role do you think does an evangelist play to explain the platform? You know, to give the example of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Salesforce and, and their outlet, uh, I mean, their, their the, the way they influence the market far exceeds the size they have. I mean, Mark Benioff, you know, with, with his role of evangelism, explaining the platform and, and reaching the wider audience, does a fantastic job explaining how Salesforce.com changes, that platform changes. So how, how, how much importance do you, do you, do you uh, assign to the person, the evangelist who explains the platform, and how much do you assign it to the platform itself? It's an interesting question, mm. and it sort of supports my theory that I've started a discussion, I haven't ended it. I haven't specifically addressed that in the book, but I do talk about the iconic uh, nature of the leaders of the Gang of Four. Steve Jobs obviously recently passed, but it was Steve's company. You know, Mark Zuckerberg is singularly identified with Facebook. Ditto Larry and Sergey with Google and, and Jeff Bezos with Amazon. So if those people leave, what happens to the platform? Um, I'm hard pressed, and there definitely are emerging platforms out there. I think it's no coincidence that Benioff is the face of Salesforce.com. Uh, for better or worse, that makes him the target if you're Larry Ellison, <laughs> but it also, okay, I know oh, Salesforce, that's Mark Benioff, right? Um, you know, there are emerging platforms out there like Twitter and WordPress that don't have as public figures, but I'm hard pressed to think of too many powerful platforms these days without a figurehead, for lack of a better term. I, I go, in the book, I talk about how when Rupert Murdoch bought MySpace, did anyone think that, oh, now MySpace is saved? Right? <laughs> Nothing against Rupert Murdoch, but does he real, is anyone really going to mistake him for another Mark Zuckerberg? So I do feel like you need to have people leading the charge, if you like, um, because the, I agree with everything that's been said so far. The platform is very dynamic. I think, uh, to Sherrick's point, you can lose people as a consumer arguably as quickly as you can lose people now as uh, an enterprise as system. An enterprise, so right. again, and this is where Adrian and I would have some very interesting discussions, I think B2C and B2B has been blurred, right? And, and then you even, the question before, I, I thought you said B2E, be an employee. So again, it's just this very different model and the old uh, IT model of a two year cycle and deployment and vendors and support and just, it had to give. But my first book is called Why New Systems Fail. And I worked on these projects and I joke with people that I had to write this book because if I didn't in 2008, I would have needed to see a shrink. Because I kept <laughs> working on these projects that were blowing up. And it's funny listening to Sherrick talk because I, I said to myself, even if I liked doing two year long ERP or CRM projects, and I was getting kind of tired of it, this ship is kind of sailing. Right, because of open source and the cloud and SaaS. And how many hospitals or big organizations needed a payroll and accounting system? Not that many, right? So, I mean, is a company of 50 or 100 people going to spend $300,000 on an Oracle license? They'd be insane, 
right? So things have gotten a lot cheaper and faster, um, but I think it doesn't hurt if you have someone out there who's widely considered to be very dynamic. I don't know if it's necessarily a requirement because everyone can talk about the benefits of the community and the ecosystem, but you know, who is sort of, I don't wanna say control because I don't think it's necessarily a linear relationship, but I think it does help if you have someone who is very identifiable. And if you look at the gang of four, you have some pretty iconic leaders. But isn't that true of any company life cycle where you have someone who's identifiable and, a, and an entrepreneurial driver until the company becomes institutionalized? Well, sometimes that, that's been the case, but I'm hard pressed in some cases to um, think of the heads of certain companies. I mean, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not Rain Man and you can always Google things, but you know, certain leaders I think have had more success than others. And I think that there are challenges today. It is a new skill set. There's a reason, just looking at Google for a moment, they're not afraid to fail. And I think that's built into Larry and Sergey's, and to some extent, Eric Schmidt's DNA. A different kind of leader, I would argue, would not have made that company as successful. Conversely, a different kind of company with a different kind of problem, like HP or Yahoo, I don't think that putting Larry and Sergey in charge would all of a sudden turn them around in either. Hmm. The difference I see today it's really about speed, and I think, Sherrick, you really, you know, the speed at which you build that ecosystem and you get that, uh, consent, uh, that conglomeration of customers around what you're doing, uh, the, the, the fact that you have to have these partners in place, you have to be able to serve that customer for life, um, I think really speaks to, if you contrast that, for example, with Groupon and where they're failing right now, is they're not building out the platform. They're one-off shop they're saying great this is good but all the me too's have come in they haven't built that loyalty system and way for people to engage and say I'm gonna keep going back to Groupon because they're gonna have the best partners or they're going to have the best prices and they're gonna give me better they're just starting now to give better prices to people who come back to their platform mm. but it, they're kinda late to the game now in that and that's why I think they're struggling so building out that ecosystem, getting that rolling very quickly is one of the uh, premise, uh, very important foundations to success today. Are there other comments or questions? Yeah. Um, um, Bill, you talked a couple of times, you said between yourself and Adrian, you have interesting conversations. Can you disclose some of those interesting conversations? <laughs> Sounds like <laughs> controversy, but I'd love to hear about the debate between you. It, it really wasn't adversarial. Just a bit. Um, yeah. It's just, I mean, we had curiosity. Because you've mentioned interesting <laughs> conversations two well, or three times. Every conversation is <laughs> interesting. It's interesting. Very good. Let's go without <laughs> right. one of those interesting conversations. Well, we talked last week, uh, and we had a, a conference call sort of in preparation, and we started talking about Netflix, and people may disagree with me, but my contention is, A, it's not a platform, because it basically is the Google circuit 1998. You do one thing on it. Uh, there aren't really open APIs. People aren't building apps on top of Netflix. But with regard to Hastings' recent foibles and the splitting the service, the cust uh, raising the prices, al alerting people to what they were doing, it's like a mm -hmm. gym membership, right? You mm -hmm. sign up in January, and then you just forget about it, and all of a sudden, <laughs> you may look at your credit card and go, oh, gosh, I pay $20 a month <laughs> at the gym. I don't even go. Um, but I would argue that in an age when things are really converging, and there isn't maybe the need to have something that's best to breed, because something could probably be good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, something has to be great in order for you to go, you know what, I know Apple has a service, or Google has a service, or Amazon is uh, inventing one, but I like Netflix and I have this history there, so I don't want to maintain separate queues and have two different bills and go, wait, mm -hmm. is this on my streaming queue, Quickster, or is this on my regular one? Um, again, that's just my opinion on it, but other people have different opinions about what Hastings ought to be doing or did wrong or the reason that there was this fury, which when you think about it, what did they lose last quarter? 800,000 subscribers on a base of what, 26 million? Right. Yeah. So you're talking about what, a 3% hit? And what did Hastings lose? How many billions of dollars? It just, it was out of whack, but mm -hmm. Adrian's point is extremely well taken, and it really, I mean, she was such a great sounding board, I, I told her she's made, if she likes, <laughs> whether she likes it or not, uh, a friend for life, because when she does more books, I'm saying, you're going to get my opinion whether you like it or not. That's <laughs> <laughs> just what you signed up for. Um, and by the way, what's your favorite bottle of wine? So I have strong <laughs> opinions about why Netflix has faltered, but I, know, I don't want to speak for Adrian, I know you don't share them all. Well, actually, uh, my opinion is, is very consistent with your opinion on that as to why Probably they faltered. I'm not sure I disagreed with you on that one. Okay. Um, I think we had more about um, whether B2B, 
<laughs> I think we're agreeing to disagree. No, um, I, I think uh, I do think that uh, Netflix faltered and they created their own Prairie Dog event, and that probably the where they faltered is they didn't build out that ecosystem enough, mm -hmm. and so um, now you look and you could say, well, I could go over to Amazon now, pay Prime, and I can download some movies. Maybe it's not quite as many movies, but it b starts to become a viable alternative in terms of another uh, platform that you mm -hmm. could jump to. It, but it I, raises I, an interesting question about how the market values a platform, even though you don't want to call them that. Given uh, 3%, I agree with you, that was not that much. But the, the story itself was enough to take a strong, and, and then he did it twice. <laughs> you know, he split them and then he brought them back together. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so the no, valuation, the volatility and the, and the stock much. valuation uh, was, was very interesting, I thought. I think to some extent the, the 40% capitalization drop is more reflective of the ability of a CEO or a C-suite to listen. And I think that the, uh, you know, the, the if, you, if you rescinded the breakup uh, into two platforms, two business models, um, <laughs> in two or three days, it, the capitalization would have recovered quickly. Whether or not they, they would have come back or not is somewhat irrelevant because it's only 3% of 20, 24 million, 26 million. The issue is uh, playing out in every sector right now, which is, uh, we were talking about this on coming over here, which is uh, Brian Moynihan, Moynihan, uh, sorry, CEO of Bank of America said, you know, we're entitled to charge so something to our our customers, yeah. it's it's not a nominal charge. I mean, it's a nominal charge in the scheme of what you spend in terms of telecommunications and data communications, etc. And yet, and yet, we, whether we're business executives in our right, we organized and said no, no. I, I you mean you if you carry this forward, if you implement this, the credit unions will be the beneficiaries. You but won't be. I, I think it's a cultural thing, though. I, I think Netflix has a challenge in, in its culture, right? Because I think that um, if, if they had listened to their customers before they had announced it, right, and they got 24 million customers they could have asked, right? They could have figured out that answer before they did it, right? I think they, and, and if you look at their online service, how much has it changed in the last so many years? It hasn't, really. How much have they delighted you? They, mm -hmm. they, it's the same thing. They made it easy to get a movie. And that's been it for years. Mm -hmm. They haven't gone outside their way. Their platform is not that social. Mm -hmm. It's not really, I guess it's a little bit mobile. Okay, give them that. But they're not really going out of their way to go delight their users. I mean, B of A, same thing with the whole ATM charge thing or the um, debit card thing, charge thing. Like, you have users you can ask. If your culture is truly about delighting the user, then you don't have to rescind the decision because that decision was already made before you announced it. Like, you, you've killed it off because you actually pay attention to your customers. Like, Apple, you know, how many times have they had to rescind things? You know, once in a great while. Um, I, just, I just think it's a cultural thing, and I don't think they, they have that culture. But, but Apple's a great example because think about what Jobs did. Was it 97 with the iMac and didn't have a disk drive? Yeah. And people were irate, but he says, you're not going to need one. So he was in a position to say, I know what's best, whereas with Hastings, yeah. right, I mean, say what you want, if he had said, look, I know there's gonna be a fall off, but this is the way to go, he didn't have the ability to do that, and that's why, I think we talked before about uh, Facebook not being the first social network, and everyone talks about first mover advantage. I think it's a key point, there is no one right secret to build a platform. One of the things I'm most proud of in the book is that there isn't a checklist. I'm not smart enough to say, do these 10 things and be the next Google. Right? Because things apply differently. Amazon, Bezos, his mantra back in 95, 96, 97, get big fast, right? Pro, pro form profits. People wanted him uh, arrested. <laughs> get out of here. You are the worst thing, stockholders screaming. Now he looks like a genius, right? So he was all about getting big fast because he knew that once you had those economies of scale and those virtual barriers of entry, he'll be in a position that he was in now, and he was right. Versus, look at what Friendster did. I'm sorry, Facebook did. They didn't want to be the next Friendster. They know that Adrian's absolutely right. People are inherently impatient. You're not, who remembers Friendster waiting two, three, four minutes for a page to load? The concept of Friendster was great. There's a fabulous book by David per Kirkpatrick that I read in researching for this book called The Facebook Effect. Mm -hmm. And he talks about one of Zuckerberg's obsessions with speed, yeah. right? Google spends they literally are figuring out ways to shave nanoseconds off of search. So time absolutely matters. So it's not simply about being first, although it can help. It, there isn't necessarily a recipe. 
that's why I, I think you, you need to really be mindful of that. Anyone who says, I would just do these five things off a platform, I, I I think you can almost look at some of the companies that are struggling today and ask, how strong is their ecosystem? How strong? Because, you know, you look at, you look at Netflix and exactly, they didn't build out their ecosystem. They tried to stick with one thing. And uh, when it came time, the switching costs were not that great from a time and attention perspective for the customer. Yes, they'd have to go back. You have to go look at your subscription. Now, I contrast that to B of A. Only 11% of customers change banks every year. How many of you have changed banks in the last year? Well, you had to because you moved, right? Pain in the ass. <laughs> had to, yes. <laughs> um, people typically don't change banks, and the reason is that they are so embedded into your day. And uh, frankly, I'd rather go spend time with my kids than worry about changing banks. Okay, yes, so I'll get, in fact, you, uh, you get these offers from, I get these offers from Chase for, gee, we'll give you $125 if you'll move over to our bank. Oh, lovely, but what's my time worth <laughs> in terms of trying to make that work? So um, unless you're moving states or you have some main reason, people don't, and that is why uh, companies like B of A are getting away. And, and what's kind of a travesty in this situation. When you look at the telcos, you look at the insurance companies, you look at, and a lot of them are in the time on autopilot segment. They almost know that they can get away with this. And um, I don't advocate poor customer service. I think that because what happens is when you do get a prairie dog event, you may cross that threshold. Your customers may cross that threshold and leave you at some point because it'll build up over time. They may not leave you the first time they're upset, but they will, it'll add up into their uh, currency account with their relationship with you. So, uh, and that's why customers explode too. I mean, it's just, oh, I can only take, uh, you know, <laughs> take this one more yeah. time. And it's because it's been building up and you keep saying, well, you know, I don't really want to change my uh, Comcast right now. Um, just a quick thing, you know the uh, triple plays? that are mm -hmm. uh, put out by the Comcast, they love that because what they're doing is the time and attention it takes to move three services mm. versus one service. It's a way that they've built their platform out and are locking you in more into their service. So, um, and that's a strategy that's done there. Um, I, my only comment is take care of your customers while you're at it. Don't, don't take right. advantage of that. And I think that one of the, uh, most important things in building a platform is not to forget that customer service matters. You still, in the book, I joke, anyone ever see that show 30 Rock? Mm -hmm. right? Liz Lyman's boyfriend, the guy who sells beepers because he thinks, and I'm quoting him, technology is cyclical, right? <laughs> Coming back, right? <laughs> so if you, it's such an, it, it's very safe. And if you don't have a product or service that people want, or if you have bad customer service, then I don't care about your platform and your ecosystem. So I think, you know, Sherrick, yeah. you're absolutely right in kind of holding your partners up to high standards because they are a representation of your company. And if, you know, look, I've been on enough contentious ERP projects to know that you know, sometimes it's the client's fault, right? But if you're, you know, where there's smoke, where there's fire, if you're consistently getting bad feedback about a consultant or a partner, you gotta kick them out of your ecosystem because ultimately they're hurting you. The switching costs, to your point, aren't nearly what they were 10, 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Right. I think so. I saw a question over here. Has it gone away? One over there. So, um, since we're speaking about Netflix and Prairie Dog events, um, what is the strategy for Netflix? Do they do they have to wait for another company to you know their other competitors shoot themselves in the foot for that to create a prairie dog <laughs> event? Or? Well, I think I think um, Netflix needs to take care of the customers that they have. They need to start expanding their platform so that uh, people really want to be there. Maybe adding social. Maybe adding. I, I don't know what the answer is for them without doing an intense analysis. But they really need to think about. How are they going to play there, especially in light when you have Apple and Google, they're all starting to talk about TV services and, mm -hmm. and streaming services now. And, um, you know, maybe it's just easier for people to move to those, other, to those other platforms. And so they need to think about what they're going to do to retain them. And also look for opportunities, like, for example, with Blockbuster or some of the other existing players where they can bring on new people. But if they if they got a better ecosystem of uh, content providers in the entertainment industry, if they get, because it's pretty thin now for mm -hmm. streaming, if they had a better platform for streaming onto your TV, not onto your computer, and and things like that, would they 
Wouldn't you see them building barriers um, that would be stronger? Potentially, potentially. Um, it just depends on how strong they're going to be relative to what the other providers have. But maybe also thinking about what are the other things people do when they buy movies? Right. You know, what, what other, you know, do they maybe want to chat with their friends right. and talk That's about movies and, and make fun of uh, housewives <laughs> as they're <laughs> watching on TV? Who knows? They could, they could move into all kinds of other ways that they can embed. And so once people are on the platform, if people are um, talking, on their platform, they're going to come back because their friends are there and they want to talk to their friends. So they, in some ways, they, they missed an opportunity, um, but no one has really dominated that opportunity yet. So it's kind of, it's kind I, of I, a I think open. You're exactly right. There's so much more they could do with it. They, they don't, you know, they delighted their users a little bit, but I think they fell asleep. You know, you look at the Amazon, right? Amazon delivered books, but they kept you engaged, right? They kept adding new things, like the, that stupid treasure chest in the corner, right? You'd click on it because it was there, it was flashing, and you're like, I got a prize, um, right? But you don't get that with Netflix. You gotta, where is the engagement? Where is the, where, how are you getting delighted? Why are you coming back to it? And so yeah, Amazon always kept thinking about that. They're like, the recommendation engine got better. They added some new stuff. Toys R Us now is a new tab, and mm -hmm. things just kept coming on to it that they just kept innovating on. And uh, that's, I think that's, they gotta go back, but they took advantage of the users, they got to go back to the user base and go, okay, what do you want? What can we do for you? How can we delight you? How can we win you back? How can we keep you? And think but about all it. hope isn't lost, and, and I agree. I think they need to either build a true platform or basically get out. Because the, you think about it, Apple is obviously an amazing company, but they can control the entire experience. If I'm watching Netflix, it's probably on a TV or a computer or a mobile device, and you're you have to almost exist on another platform or device to, to use it. Mm -hmm. So that's a risk mm -hmm. for them. But on the positive side, they have this incredible trove of information. There's this process called collaborative filtering that I mentioned in the book, and Amazon uses it, and basically tagging information, right? So when I blog, it's the sort of antithesis of it back in the old days going into a library, and the book was only in one part, one section, because right? It was a biography. It wasn't under business. It wasn't under something else. So they know who watches what movies and that they rate them. And that's valuable information yep. because, again, in terms of e-commerce functionality, what if they were, and this is tricky, gently able to suggest things. So one of my, my favorite show, anyone ever see Breaking Bad? About the high school chemistry teacher who starts manufacturing crystal meth because he's got lung cancer and a pregnant wife? Unbelievable show. I've right. heard great things about it, yeah. You want to you talk about an evangelizer right here. True story. I was on TV a couple times for the last book. I don't care about that. I'm most proud of being on a Breaking Bad commercial, right? Because AMC had this contest. So submit a video and you could talk about the show. And there's me, you know, Phil S. from Caldwell, New Jersey, which is where I used to live. And I'm talking about how a lot of shows will blur the line between good and bad and Breaking Bad obliterates it. And that's in there. And I saw that and I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I've turned on so many of my friends to this show that what if they could tap into that social mm -hmm. aspect? You got someone who's rating it five stars. Mm -hmm. I can't wait. Unbelievable show. What if they can connect? And there are services out there that do it. There's one called Get Glue. If anyone's ever heard of that, you can literally watch a show in theory with someone in real time. But again, you could do this on Facebook too. I could be watching Facebook. And if you look at the statistics now, this isn't 1985 when people just watch TV. People are watching TV and texting it on their iPad or on their laptop. They're doing a million different things, right? I don't know how people can actually pay attention to the show. So <laughs> what can they do with that information? Again, I don't have all the solutions, but if you're focusing on being a standalone service, and this is why I think Netflix really screwed up, mm -hmm. That's really dangerous because you're giving more fodder to companies that have these platforms and go, yeah, why don't we expand our video or our movie plank? Because the studios are going to make deals with whoever can make the money. I don't think they're that loyal to Netflix. Mm -hmm. We're not. I think we have a question over here. Uh, two things. One, one is uh, having two Gen Ys ourselves. I'm curious that you haven't brought up anything about the video making platforms, which are mm. huge entree to a captive audience. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, Zynga, yeah, right? yeah, gamification. Um, Zynga uh, made $300 yeah. million dollars last year, actually more than that last year, it's uh, analysts report. Um, what did they sell? Does anybody know what they sold for that $300 million? The social thing, game things? Virtual goods. Virtual goods. There you go. Air. They sold virtual 
goats, <laughs> virtual cows. What a business. No inventory. <laughs> what no a cow business. mess to clean up. You just sell a virtual cow. Virtual cows. Right. Um, so, smell. yeah, that is huge. That is no absolutely huge. And so either. when you look at a company like Zynga that's partnering with Facebook, and now they're talking about partnering with Google, so they're doing the whole partnering thing, because um, Google's now saying, hey, we want some of that. We want people to spend time on our platform. But they're coming out with new games all the time. So they also are in the time magnet space. They have to continue to mm -hmm. to keep okay. coming out with, you know, there's, there's Farmville, there's Cityville, there's Mafia Wars. Mafia Wars. Just lots mm -hmm. of things to pull them in what, and keep One them could going. argue, is that another um, gang of four that eventually Zynga the platform becomes, I don't know, so you start building your own games on it. The, the reason right. I wouldn't call Zynga a platform just yet is that it's really a, in a really important plank on, at this point, Facebook's platform. Yeah. And yes, they're mm -hmm. going to go with Google. But mm -hmm. one of the interesting things is you almost have this um, uh, mutually assured destruction. So if Facebook were to ever say, we're turning off Zynga, that kills Zynga, but it also takes a lot of money away from Facebook, because now with Facebook credits, they get 30%. So that's another notion in the book of, of frenemies and coopetition, right? It's very uneasy, which I think makes a lot of people uncomfortable. This is why mm -hmm. I think that either people are going to go, you're completely right with this book, or you're insane. Because the old way of doing <laughs> things often was, we have to do it here. We have to control everything. And I think in the age of the platform, in large part, it's about giving up total control. Right now, not everything is totally open. You may make APIs available, right? But we've seen this in the um, Apple Store, right? I mean, Steve Jobs had actually said, I quote in the book, "We don't need any more fart apps," right? So, and there actually was this really interesting story of a company that had spent something like two million dollars on a marketing budget, and Apple would not approve the app. What could they do, <laughs> right? So it's it's if you want to play by their rules, you have to kind of ante up to the tune of thirty percent or some terms that you may not like. Yeah, there's some, there's some interesting things going on, too, um, in partners. I was talking to a company last week that um, some of these companies are garnering their developers. And they're saying, if you develop for our platform, you are not mm. to develop for this other platform. Mm. And so they're, they're trying to lock in some of the agreements with the developers. It's, it's a very interesting dynamic that's going on that's out with some of these players right now. Well, well, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually wanted to make a couple points about that. It, it, it will go back to the point of speed. I also want to tie it to something you brought up in your question, Mark, and then I'm going to wing it all the way back to what do we do as companies in the form of creating a counter strategy to the way we approach the market today, which is much more anticipatory. So point number one, today, what is the second most popular game on Facebook. It is an EA game. A EA, which is redefining it, you know, it was it mm -hmm. was of the old school. Old school. We yep. sell DVDs and they are mm -hmm. the transaction and you just trust us on a year over year basis to update the game. So when Zynga has Farmville at 54 million active users, EA has the second at 37 million active users. Now Zynga still has seven of the top ten. But this point about platform wars within a mega platform um, is about to uh, emerge. Point one. Point two, when, when Netflix thinks about whether they stay, they build planks, um, this is our job, right? I mean, Netflix is at a point where they are making live or die business strategy decisions based upon partnerships. And one of the questions they have to ask is, you know, do we, do, what do we seed and what do we go in? You asked, you asked almost a philosophical question, something that GE made formulaic for, but which is, um, wh uh, what, what, is it, what is it we're going to do, number one or number two? And what is it, is this so far past we could never catch up? And do we, and if we think we can catch up, how, do, how long do we invest? and hold that position as number two, hoping for a mistake from number one, right? These are, these are partnering, these are strategy decisions, and they're being fused faster and faster. Last point, uh, Jean-Claude VK departed. One, one of, when, and I go back to, um, wh what does one do about this? Um, e even if you're not gonna be the gang of four, the next gang of four, what does one do about this? There, the, the um, ideas around what Salesforce already brought to market, the chief customer success officer, the idea of the chief platform officer, the idea of the chief contrarian officer, right? You, you have to begin to think, if you're going to make mistakes, 
let's be, let's be positive about, hey, we tried something, we made a mistake, but we learned from you, and we captured that, and we will re, you know, reapproach. And, and it, it's continuous. And I think that we as large organizations, particularly the large organizations, have got to um, allow for a line of thinking that really, that really is going to make a lot of the existing, the people who have had 20 and 25 year careers, the people that Phil is going to speak to in Washington in a week or two, uh, a couple w in December, upset. And, and it's, maybe it's better you're upset before you're dethroned, right? Because we see it. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. Important. In the, um, in the new uh, Steve Jobs book, uh, Jobs was, I guess, paranoid about the innovator's dilemma, but he was thinking, I would rather cannibalize my business than have somebody else do it. Yeah. Right. Well, a question back there, and then let's take a couple more questions and start to, start to wrap up. So, uh, in, in the paradigm of the ecosystem and the platform, how does that apply down the network stack? Are the same lessons applicable? Uh, for example, I'm with Cisco. I make plumbing and infrastructure. My bosses would argue I make something else too, but how does it apply? Well, they're, it's funny because, and you know more about Cisco than I do, but if you look at what they're doing with telepresence, I think it's smart. Build out that plank. Understanding that for a small company, uh, what was the one that I saw? Um, it's the orange logo. It competes with Skype. There's an iPhone app board. It was, it was just on uh, Bloomberg West. Like Tango. So it, you got Tango, you got Skype, you got all these different ones. Maybe for a small business that's good enough, but for a larger business can afford a telepresence license, which is what, $250,000, give or take? Um, I think that is a plank to develop. Is there a way to downscale that so it's maybe better than Skype, but more affordable? Uh, again, are there planks out there? Uh, again, you can't be everything to everybody. No one's saying that Cisco should also give ballet lessons. Mm -hmm. right? But are there related things that could potentially result in happy accidents? One of the things that um, I talk about in the book um, is start to visualize for the customer what's happening simultaneously for the customer. Now, it may be a little bit less on a network stack than it would, say, be a consumer. Um, what are they doing simultaneously? Definitely applies to the uh, Gen Y <laughs> as they're all multitasking and what's happening. But there may be something going on simultaneously. And then you also want to look at the sequential. What's happening before, what's happening after. It's a good way to kind of take a 360 view on your offering and kind of what's the bigger picture of what's going on and do I need to be playing into that o and building out that overall ecosystem. Um, let me give you an example of this kind of thinking. Um, I just did a project for a major consumer package company and they're trying to visualize, um, you know, they have their traditional, they sell to the grocery stores, they sell to the consumer. They're actually envisioning how will consumers manage using iPads in the home? And what can they be doing as a company to help with replenishment of the pantries, to help with health care kinds of issues? And how do they need to build that out? So what might happen in this case is maybe the supermarkets may be taken out of the, out of the picture. It might be a completely new way of servicing their customers because if they start building an application about not just I'm going to sell, um, I don't know, widgets, uh, a wid uh, yeah, a consumer mm -hmm. widget, but I'm going to have this entire app for replenishment of the pantry and I'm going to help them, kind of like the concept of a Kindle. Think of the Kindle, how you read a book. Uh, they're going to have this in the home and gee, you know, I'm, I'm going to have these consumer goods that I'm going to need and it's going to help me figure this out. But Or maybe I have health care, you know, I'm doing um, beauty products or things like that. So, so really trying to rethink from the customer perspective. So there might be things from a communications perspective if you think about how corporations try to communicate. What is it that they're really trying to do, both um, looking at that uh, vertically as well as horizontally in the process? And so I would, um, the telepresence is, is an example of that. Um, there, I think um, there's some other uh, enterprise examples in terms of what corporations are trying to do to communicate and how can you play into what business users need. You know, I, I think you just answered my, some of my question, a part of my question. But I was going to say your model here could basically be applied to uh, 
maybe an industry and and you could say okay you know these are the players in this in this in this quadrant these are the players in this quadrant for example the airline industry mm -hmm. oh, if you've got Priceline you've got Expedia you got mm -hmm. Travelocity mm -hmm. And then you got the airlines themselves trying to all trying to get the attention of the consumers and, and sell sell tickets basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, you could potentially apply this and say, okay, where is where are these players? Where are these other players? And mm -hmm. who's who's going to move quickly to that time magnet mm -hmm. quadrant mm -hmm. and take take the take the cake? You know? Well, you see a little bit of that um, with what Virgin, I haven't been on Virgin, but I, I keep, everybody I talk to tells me what Love a great it. experience They delight it the is. user, I'm telling you, <laughs> fantastic. They and so they're pulling people back. I don't know if they're the best priced one or not, I haven't flown them. No, they, don't, they, don't, they don't, I mean they'll be a little bit on price, but they're not like the low cost airline. Yeah, so they're not they, the But isn't that the best place to be though? Don't you want, wouldn't you rather be Apple than Dell Computer? Wouldn't right. you want to have 40% mm -hmm. margins as opposed to 9% margins and going down? Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly where you want to be. You obviously have to wor worry about time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. where you are, but mm -hmm. I think one of the most dangerous things you can do is compete on cost. You right. want to delight, you want to compete on quality, you want to say, look, we're not yeah. the cheapest game in town, but we think we're the best. And if you want, go someplace right. else, but we're confident that we're, you're going to come back. So from a B2B perspective on that, um, I you may want to go into the time on autopilot and be the corporate jets that just are the, uh, or the airline that the corporation has picked. And because you have developed some kind of relationship and you're embedded mm -hmm. into the business process. That could be another way to think about that. I think I was just basically throwing out an idea for your yeah. next stage of your book. <laughs> 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 it's interesting, yeah. Consulting friends here that, okay, there's plenty, plenty of things Yeah, I, I call this a yeah. framework and not a model for a reason. It's Because it's, it, you're going to find uh, things that won't work in this situation, or you're going to see things where, you know, maybe there's two quadrants that really apply to this situation, or you're going to have, um, I was talking to Sherrick about how you can have within a portfolio, you can have the CRM strategy and you can have the strategy with the chatter, but, you know, you're going to be doing different things in those, in those elements, and you just want to recognize the strategies and the skills and the innovation that's going to be needed to succeed in those kind of quadrants. Yeah, it was one of the, uh, I wouldn't call it, even call it a debate, but it was, as, as the slide had it, you know, there's social enterprise in the one quadrant and there's social CRM, or not social CRM, Salesforce CRM in the, in the lower quadrant, which for a long time is the way people used our software. It was, you know, you get in, you get out, you get done, and it, it, you're on autopilot. And we're pushing, we're trying to push all those people now up. Like that's, that's great, and we can live on that. And in fact, we'll grow to three billion without even having to, to push anyone up, because just because on autopilot, we'll just grow naturally. But we're trying to now push everyone up. Like, no, no, that's not good enough. So customers who are flat in their usage, like they're happy and they're flat, but they're not adding anything. Now we're looking at that going, that's not good enough. You should be looking at doing more. There's more you can do. So you should not be thinking of Salesforce as autopilot. You should be thinking of how do you better engage with your customers, better engage with your partners within your own company, better delight the user, et cetera. So but, but if you think about it happy. in terms we're of Adrian's model and, and what I talk about in the book, you're talking about having people not think about Salesforce as a CRM plank, but as part of an overall platform, as part of an ecosystem, exactly. because if you say, that's where you almost get the lock-in, right? I yeah. don't want to get off of it because it isn't just a CRM system. I can go to Sugar CRM or another tool. I'd actually... I'm <laughs> locked in too. I'm enjoying it, number one, but number two, the, to get to Adrian's point about time, it would take too much to switch, and hopefully people are just delighted to begin with. So you have the carrot and the stick. And that way they're going to generate more revenue for you and refer people and grow the ecosystem, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, because um, you bring up a, uh, you brought up something that uh, I wanted to make sure we understood. Time on autopilot is about the customer. The customer doesn't want to think about it. They just want it to work. But time on, that doesn't mean that vendors or companies in that space are on autopilot. Those companies have to be working really hard at building out their ecosystem. It's just what they need to do is a little bit different in terms of thinking about how do you make this autopilot for my customers. Let's take one more question, if, if there's one out there. Okay, um, I think this has been, I, I've enjoyed this thoroughly, and I think that it's been a, a, a delightful and engaging discussion. And in particular, for those of us in the alliances profession, I think we're seeing how platforms 
are so dependent on the development of alliances, partners, ecosystems, that this is a perfect discussion uh, for us. And, and the lights, <laughs> and we're done. As it stays left. And we will, we will continue along this theme in uh, future game changers. Uh, the next one is February 7th, also at Cisco with Steve, Stein Steve Steinhilber. Uh, the uh, title being uh, Beyond Alliances, Aligning Co Ecosystems with Corporate Strategy. And on March 13th, uh, we'll all be reminding you of this, but on March 13th, uh, we will be doing something with a partner of ours, uh, an association, uh, SVA AMA, the Silicon Valley American Marketing Association, on how the kind of the more focused marketing pieces of this uh, fit into platforms and ecosystems and the whole digital value chain. So we'll be doing that along with the traditional uh, ASAP events that, that you've known from the past. But this is, I think, an example of where we want to take our forward-looking thinking. Uh, I also want to say that this is not the end of this discussion in addition to our other uh, panel discussions, because we will continue this on, online. Uh, and Phil and Adrian have, have agreed to engage in a discussion, and we can engage with each other. So, you know, if we're going to have, you know, on talk LinkedIn. about, on and I'm, I'm, I'll get that, right. Uh, on LinkedIn. Not on the website. What website? Um, so, That's we would love to have, this is a, you know, Given this discussion, I think it's a, it's a perfect place for our members and regular attendees to continue to engage with us on this and other subjects. You will, if you are on the Eventbrite, and if you're not on the Eventbrite uh, registration list, you'll, you'll get it sooner, soon. Otherwise, within 10 minutes on your inbox, you will see an email message saying where the LinkedIn group is that we'll be having this discussion. And you'll also be getting a pointer to a questionnaire, which please fill out because we would love to know what you thought about this, how we can improve it, and where we should go uh, going forward. I want to thank you. This has just been delightful and enlightening. And um, with that, Nima, I think we have some gifts. We do. And for as much as we've talked about <laughs> the future of the world, our gifts are timeless. And uh, <laughs> timeless, as in, is it a yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is very little. There is very little you need to say. Oh, that that's is, a good that I is <laughs> more enchanting than the I notion of a beautiful Syrah wine for our panelists to thank them thank for you. their time and energy in helping us get ready. Thank you. And uh, see so if I can pull this off without dropping it, which I cannot. Um, and, and, and lastly, a final thank you to Cisco for making this all happen. And Roger, if I'm allowed to walk back here, take this home and enjoy it. Thank you very much. So with that, we are done, with the exception of the online discussion, which I guess can get start any time. We thank you again. I know we went fairly long tonight. We hope you enjoyed it. We're here, and we'll look forward to seeing you in February. Bye-bye.